Hey, good afternoon everyone. Trackman44 here. You know, I tell you all the time that I do not do how-to videos. Matter of fact, I go out of my way to tell people don't do the things that I do in the manner in which I do them. I don't do anything that intentionally endangers myself and especially the people that work around me. But at any rate, there are some things that do bear a little bit of thought when you get ready to use them. And for that, I thought I was going to uh, dispel a few myths about these dangerous saws, as they're called. For in particular, this guy right here, it's a, it's a buzz saw and behind a, an old tractor. It's all kinds of myths abound about the danger of these saws. If you just uh, go to Google Tube or YouTube and type in saw of death or any number of horrible names for a saw, you'll come up with guys running buzz saws and everything like that. And you hear all kinds of stories about how everybody and his brother knows somebody that had an arm or leg cut off or, or worse, you know. And uh, they are dangerous. They are dangerous. But like Mo Man said, Many, many times you say, boys, keep your head out of your tail end and you'll be just fine. So all it requires is just a little bit of common sense and just paying attention to what it is that you're doing and where you're sticking your hands. There's a number of other things, too, and I was going to take a few minutes to point out a couple of things that are quite obvious to guys like myself that have been around them for very near to 60 years. We've cut a tremendous amount of wood with them over the years, sawmill slabs, pole wood, you know, limb wood, whatever you want to call it. And we've never really had any, any major accidents whatsoever. None of us ever even had a cut or a scratch in relation to the, uh, to the blade. Let's go ahead and talk about the old thing. Then we'll run a, a couple of passes through and kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. First point is your personal protection. You know, there's varying levels of what individuals feel is safe. I personally am never without my prescription glasses, which are safety glass. Uh, don't buy them any other way. I always wear safety toe shoes, virtually everything I'm doing. I also wear hearing protection. Hearing protection is of particular importance whenever you're running around these buzz saws because these buzz saws, they emit some, some pretty intense sound right here in the vicinity of the blade. It does some howling, does some screaming, and it's very, very hard on your ears. There's no doubt about it. And another thing, a lot of people wear chaps and things like that. You should wear gloves. Sometimes if I'm using, depending on the type of wood, I'll probably slip gloves on, especially scaly bark hickory, things like that, stuff that has exceptionally rough bark. But gloves are, they're up to you, you know. If you got, you know, like lily white fingers and all that stuff, you know, and want to protect them, and that's fine. Not that everybody that wears gloves has lily white fingers, but they stand a better chance of having them if they wear gloves. I don't particularly wear gloves unless my hands get cold or uh, the conditions are so bad that it, it actually hurts my hands. That's first and foremost. Obviously, this thing is going to ramp forward. You can see how far it goes in and intersects that piece by roughly 10 inches. So the front part of the table will actually go 10 inches beyond the edge of that blade. So when you're here sawing wood, you really should work with the helper. It's, it's by far the best to work with the helper, but that's not always the case, and I very seldom get the opportunity to work with the helper, but we'll address that in a little bit. But you want to get both hands on the piece, and you want to rock this in to the piece, like into the blade like that. And like I said, ideally your helper, helper will be here, and he'll take the piece, the off bear the piece, and toss it into the shed. Then you can go ahead and pull it back by whatever means possible. Uh, I have springs down here, but we're actually tilting a little bit down uh, uphill, so uh, it doesn't want to spring back right there. So uh, you, you should have springs on it that actually push the table back. You want to make sure whenever you're coming in that your hand isn't anywhere near intersecting with the blade and definitely your forearm. Like if you were to get up here and possibly slip a little bit, I guess you can probably see my forearm is about uh, three inches from the elbow and I've done got about a six inch laceration in there uh, and I'm ble bleeding profusely at that point. That's how quick and fast these can happen. I've never had it happen to me nor anybody that I've been working with. Uh, the old man, none of my brothers, none of us have ever had an issue like that. But it's still something that you've got to keep in your mind all the time because this thing is turning, uh, in my case, about 600, 620 RPM. And at a 32 inch diameter, that's a lot of teeth per minute or per second coming past your, uh, past your pinkies. But if you must work by yourself and you, ha you don't have a way to do anything with the off fall other than let it build up, you do not want to let it build up to a great extent. Because what will happen is as you're allowing that to build up here, it'll get higher and higher and higher. And before you know it, it'll shift or a piece will just kind of roll and get into the blade. It'll quack into here, it'll lodge everything, it'll, it'll not, uh, jump your belt off, or worse yet, it'll send some of these pieces of flying, and in some cases it can pick up a chip and throw it right back at you. And that's not a good scenario whatsoever. So if you must operate by yourself, I would make about 10 or 12 cuts at the very, very most, 
go ahead and shut everything down and remove those pieces, toss them away. If you got a conveyor, man, that'd be the berries. If you've got a trailer right there, that's the absolute berries. Or like myself, I cut those straight into wood shed, works perfectly. But do not let that wood build up right here. That has happened to me a number of times, and I try not to let that happen uh, because it's not good. In addition to that, you can damage your blade too uh, whenever you get that jammed in there. Many times you'll see us whenever we're cutting this, we'll flip a piece around or whatever, and we'll just take about two inches off of it or whatever right here. That's because the piece that's left over is just a little bit too long for our stoves or for our furnaces, and we'll want to whack it just, you know, just a couple of inches off. And so we just flip it around or whatever, you know, and go ahead and whack two inches off, maybe two, two and a half inches. You got to be very, very careful because that too can become lodged right here into this area right here, and it can just, it can just really create some problems. It'll just go to howling, it'll pop out of there, it'll just jerk everything, and it'll just scare the bejesus out of you. So you definitely want to be very, very careful uh, in that situation. That happens a little more frequently than what you, uh, what you want. Another thing, if you watched any number of my uh, buzzsaw videos, you'll see many, many times, I'll, while I'm going to get another piece of wood, you'll see me kick back and forth like this, kind of clear, clear the area. There's a reason for that, simply because all the little pieces that get cut off, little guys like this, little short stubs that just kind of fall down there, or just if you leave all that debris down there while you're working and you're stepping back and forth, all it takes is just a just a wrong step on the right on the right piece, and you you shift, you lose your balance, your feet will slip a little bit out from under you, and you'll go to slip slide whatever, and you'll grab without even thinking about it, you'll grab onto something, and that could create an issue because you could get your hand in the blade very very easily. So you will see me during the course of uh, the videos just kicking that debris away, the debris and the sawdust away. You always hear stories about flat belts and how dangerous they are. And yes, they really are. This one here, not so much because as I converted this into a part takeoff driven unit with a, a right angle drive gearbox, it necessitated just a very sharp flat belt right here. And that's just a little more than a one to one ratio. It's about a 1.1 or 1.12 to one ratio to get me on my 540 RPM uh, power takeoff, give me about 620 RPM on the, uh, on the Arbor. But there's not enough exposed here and we don't work in the proximity of it enough to be much of a danger at all. But you do have to pay attention, in my case, when you walk by this to go adjust a throttle on the tractor or to put the part takeoff in gear, out of gear, uh, or stop the machine, you always want to make sure that you're walking right past these moving components because they can be unforgiving. They can reach out and snag a loose or a floppy piece of britches or something like that, possibly even a shirt tail, and it can, uh, it can, it can be quite harmful. These things were originally built to operate with a big, long, flat belt that went up to a power unit or to a tractor, and so the flat belt was, at that particular point, 15 or 20 feet away, uh, in a lot of cases more than that. And the belt would have a tendency to be a little bit loose and everything, you know. And so we, it would reach out and grab you if you got too close to it, too. So you, you, if you have a situation to where you run a flat belt that's 15, 20 foot long or longer, you have to be very careful when you're walking past that because that, that belt will create a, an issue for you. That's probably one thing that does do a little bit of damage. Because a lot of times guys will use belt dressing on that flat belt. Uh, because it's so hard to get your belt tension just exactly right to minimize your slippage and everything because you have to drive those stationary rigs into the ground with bars. A lot of times they won't get them driven in the ground quite good enough and you put a little tension on with the tractor backing up. The tractor weighs, you know, 2,800, 3,000, 3,500 pounds and it wants to shift your rig just a little bit, shift your rig, your belt runs off. So a lot of times they run them a little bit looser than what's, what's recommended and that looseness or that flippy flop is what's very notorious for grabbing shirt tails and, and uh, like bibs, baggy bibs and, and things like that. Now like the saw blades themselves, you hear all kinds of horror stories about the actual part takeoff unit. I told you I took this old stationary rig, that's in other videos too, and I converted this to operate off of a part takeoff by building a, a three uh, three point A frame unit for the back of uh, any Category 1 tractor and put that right angle drive off a of John Deere haybine and convert it with a short coupled power takeoff shaft. So I'm pretty much eliminated any potential of any entanglement whatsoever. You got to really be a fool to somehow or another get anything that you own entangled in this part takeoff shaft in operation. So this particular one requires no added safety or, or concern whatsoever because it's virtually impossible for everybody but an imbecile to get tied up into it. 
But if you do have one that operates off of a prior takeoff shaft and the tractor sits three or four feet away, you definitely want to be careful, especially if your prior takeoff engages towards the rear end of the tractor. A lot of old antique tractors, they'll engage their prior takeoff right back here by the prior takeoff unit itself, and you've got to be right near this thing while it's rotating to engage it and to disengage it. Those tractors you have to definitely be careful of. This little tractor here operates off the side. I've One thing to point out too, the reason I'm doing this little video concerning safety and the operation of the buzzsaw, because I've had a couple of comments on different videos where people suggested that possibly I do a little bit of a, a safety video concerning their operation. So I certainly hope I'm not boring y'all with, with uh, unnecessary facts. Uh, if you don't have the saw rig, I'm sure you don't really have any concern. But again, you might have had the opportunity to have come up with one or bought one and we're afraid of it because of things that you heard. It's nothing to be afraid of. You just got to, you know, respect the piece of equipment. Like the old man always said, got to keep your head out of your tail end when you use this stuff, boys. If you take a look, you can see how this, this thing looks like it towers over this little Kubota. Actually, it's absolutely perfectly, perfectly sized for this B71 manual transmission. 1981 or 82, I think is when I bought this one, brand spanking new. But it's a 16 horse, three cylinder diesel. And that tractor is absolutely perfectly matched for what I need for this machine right here. Now you can run it with a much bigger machine and it does exactly the same thing. It works just fine and dandy. It burns more fuel and gets exactly the same job done. This little Kubota will sit here and run all day long and just literally sip the fuel. I run it wide open throttle in first gear of power takeoff. I've got a three speed power takeoff. I got 540, 1080 and 15 something, you know, or a 1600 but I always run it in 540 RPM, wide open throttle, and it just purrs like a kitten, does a great job, never overheats, and never burns a tremendous amount of fuel at all. And I've been using it on this tractor, it's been dedicated to this tractor for I don't know how many years, probably close to, close to 10 or 12 years now. Don't even put it on the old Ford or anything like that. I got other rigs that go on that one, and I got other rigs for the front end of other tractors too, just because it's kind of nice to exercise your equipment. But at any rate, that's nothing to do about safety, but I uh, did want to let you know that it is kind of nice having a small compact tractor that you can move around on. You can take this thing right out in the middle of the woods, you drop a tree, you got all your branches cut and trimmed right there. Instead of wasting your time cutting them all up in little pieces out in the woods, you can just, just take the other trailer along with another tractor and, and a helper, and you can just dice these things up, throw them right in the trailer, right there out in the woods, or you can leave this back up to shop and haul the trailer loads of pole wood back to the shop, stack them, stage them right here by the woodshed and like we do and then process them, boom, and straight into the woodshed with absolute minimal effort. That's the way we prefer to do it. When it comes to stacking your wood, okay, there is a method to the madness. If you notice, virtually all of this wood right here is stacked. There's a couple exceptions here and there, uh, but there, virtually all of this wood is stacked with the big end facing the tractor or facing the woodshed and that's because of the way we back the saw rig in, we back the saw rig in to where we can come right off of the pole wood pile right into the saw rig and then right up into the woodshed. The reason you want that big end this way here is because it's unbalanced. The larger the difference in the end of the piece of material, the more unbalanced it's going to be. Well, you don't want to pick up the small end and put the small end into the saw because the counterweight is hanging out here off the table and it's just wanting to pull, yourself, pull itself down and you're fighting it up there using extra energy and strength to keep that small end level going into the saw rig. So always put your butt cuts or your large diameter through the saw first because that's where the weight is. You want to get rid of that weight and that way it'll counterbalance the rest of the, the piece of pole wood or limb wood and it just makes your day a whole lot easier. Then you come around to the ones that are like this right here. If you take a look at this crooked thing right here, those really get to be tricky. Sometimes, very rarely, you'll see while we're sawing wood or processing pole wood, you'll see a, a little bit of a pinch and invariably that's on some of this crooked wood. Whenever you get ready to put this through there, you want to make sure you've got a good grip on that wood to where it's going to go through and maintain its same plane all the way through the cut. If it shifts or twists or drops down at whatever, you're immediately putting pressure on that blade and you're going to jump, throw your belt off or, or whatever or cook your blade, get your blade a little bit warm right there in just a few seconds time. Uh, and it's just really, or worse, it can jerk this out of your hand and you know, hit the guy that's working with you, hit him right upside the head, but it will jerk it out of your hand though. Um, 
and so it just it just makes sense. Get your big ends in there first, and you have to get the, a bear hug on these crooked pieces to hold them level as you're entering all the way through the cut. The first time you have that happen to you, you're going to say, boy, oh boy, I know what he's talking about, because it will happen, and it will happen in a hurry. So a lot of times when, you're, when you watch us guys throw that on that table, you'll see us kind of Jimmy Jack and kind of shuffle it around a little bit, you know, just to get it exactly right. That's because we're, we're calculating and figuring out real quickly how we want to hold that to start that cut. So there is a method, like I say all the time, there is a method to the badness, but you have to understand what it is we're doing. And it all has to do with safety because, like I said, if that thing pinches and binds, you know, it can jerk right out of there. It can pull your arm right into the saw. There's any number of things that can happen. That brings up another point. Here's a prime example. See how that wants to rock back and forth. You better make sure you've got a, a good grip on it and you're going to end the cut in the position in which you start to cut. Okay, another thing that can very seriously happen. If you've got a sharp piece and you're going into your cut right here and you don't have the right grip on it, what will happen, especially if it's nice and round, it can catch in that and it can just spin that thing around, just spin it around just so rapidly like that, and then just move it this way or that way, depending on how that blade catches and pulls it, and it can definitely drag your hand, your arm, right into that spinning blade. So that's of the utmost importance. Another thing to note when you're working with a helper, remember how I said that whenever you start that cut, you want to go through that cut on the same plane. When you're working with the helper, He's going to be here on the other side of the blade, on the off-bearing side of the blade, and you're going to be operating the tilt table. And so you want to work with that same person for a while and work slowly until you kind of get into the swing of things. And all you're doing on this side is you're just very lightly and gently holding that block. As you make the pass in, then you can go ahead and grip, off-bear it, and swing right into the trailer, into the woodshed, while he goes ahead and sets the next piece in, and then you're ready to come in. And you get that swinging and routine motion. One thing that you do not want to do, the, the off-bearer never puts any undue pressure on the piece of wood. Once again, remember that plane. If the off-bearer here grabs it and starts going, what happens is he's going to force that wood crooked as you're entering the blade like that because he's an aggressive of a move. So he has to just lightly hold right here while the operator, while the guy that's in control, pushes it through the cut. Then and only then do you grab it. But you can see what happens if you're real aggressive and you jerk it, you jerk it out of his hand, you may even jerk his hand in front of the area that could intersect the blade. There's many ways to use this as a one-man operation. The main thing that you want to do is don't let it build up a whole lot around the bottom of the blade. I'm going to make a few cuts and then I'm going to show you the potential behind what it was that we described earlier. Secondly, you don't really want to do what I do. I've got 60 years on these machines, literally 60 years worth of um, operation on them. My threshold for safety is a little bit different than the threshold of safety should be on somebody that's a rookie on one. Uh, I know what to expect out of them in virtually any situation that we get in. As a beginner you're not going to understand all that so you will not do it the way I do it and I'm going to show you what I do. I end up standing virtually in front of the blade and I push with both hands and I off bear with my right hand because I don't like to stop the process and pick up everything off the ground and throw them into the woodshed. So I operate with my right hand on the right side of the blade and my left hand on the left side of the blade and I'm standing fairly close to being in front of it. Like I said, that's not something I want to uh, encourage you to do until you get 30 or 40 years experience <laughs> with them because it, it, it is definitely dangerous. Anytime you're in front of that blade, you face the potential for your feet kicking out from under you if your feet kick out from under you as you're on a forward lean pushing into the blade, you know what can happen. You can fall right straight face forward into the blade and that can give you a really, really bad day. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and fire it up and I'm operated as a one man, of course. I don't have a helper today, but I'm going to go ahead and let them drop uh, to the ground and then we'll take a look and see what that potential danger could possibly be. In no way am I suggesting that you do it like this. You just develop your own techniques, like I said before. But just realize, as long as you, as long as you keep your wits about yourself, keep the area clear, and don't do anything stupid, these things are just fine. So let's start it up, cut off a few chunks, and uh, take a look. <laughs>
right now, after about 30 cuts or thereabouts, you can see the, the recipe for disaster just in the making right now. As a matter of fact, a couple of cuts ago, you saw one pinch in the blade and got one of the little offshoots flung off to the side. But if you take a look at this piece right here, right now, one of the very last few pieces I cut, and that's the reason I stopped the video, because right now is when it's going to start getting more and more dangerous. If you take a look right here, I pull this back, looky right there, you can actually see what's happening with that piece of wood. Could possibly lodge right into here and really wreak some havoc. And then, if you take a look, see right here, I must twist this around to where my feet are. Okay, you know those little sharp pieces that I've been cutting off at the end to kind of square up the pieces and everything? This is where my foot is, right here. If you take a look, both of my feet are in contact with one of these little things. That's going to make me lose my step or whatever, or misstep, and create a problem, you know, for possibly slipping and sliding into the blade. So that's when it's time to stop, pick this all up, and then do the, the routine of kicking out all the stuff away from your feet. And make sure you've got a good clean area around your feet at all times. Very, very, very important. As I'm stacking those cuts, I had to be very gentle. I didn't want to dislodge this, but I wanted to show you this little round off cut that just lodged right there in resting. It happened to stop right there. It was kind of propped up with some wood, you know, but it just caught perfectly in there. Had that bounced and came just right and came in contact right here, it would have been immediately drawn up into the blade. Uh, the blade would have cut into it. It would have stalled the blade, the arbor, I'm sure, because it would have hit with such force. It would have just jerked it right in there, and it probably would have jumped my belt off. So that's a, that's a very, good, uh, very good thing that it actually lodged and stayed right here on the side. I wanted to make sure that I showed you the potential. Because, again, this is just a little bit too long to go into my, sh into my stoves, you know, and so I want to make sure that all of them are reasonably close to 16 inches. 17 inch, it's like, you know, it's just not good. So... You have to be aware of that kind of situation. Now if you take a look around my feet, I've already got this area cleaned up. I've already kicked the debris and everything away, the, the pieces, the large pieces that I could trip on. And of course the sawdust and everything. You want that sawdust in the snow. One of the worst things to do is to use these buzz saws in the snow. Uh, because as you're walking around, snow itself is not bad, but as soon as you compact it, that snow turns into ice. Whenever you have ice, of course it's slick. And the last thing you want to be is on a slick surface around this blade. What we're going to do now is a couple of those dog-legged crooked ones to kind of show you how you have to make sure that you hold them steady as you enter the blade. And then I'm just going to go ahead and show you how I do them one-handed on either side of the blade to throw directly in the shed to minimize my effort in uh, having to bend over and picking them all up. Again, that technique's not recommended for you guys at all. <laughs>
Now, I did not do that intentionally, but that one nice, really long one, about two or three sticks ago, that had a nice, big, long curve in it. If you notice, I lost a little bit of my grip with my left hand as I entered that cut, and I dropped it just a little bit, and you heard it start squalling and howling, and you can see the blade start kicking a little bit. That's because I dropped that, and I did not maintain that steady plane all the way through the cut. That's the drawback of working, you know, by, your, by yourself with one hand on either side of the blade. But uh, that was a very good indication of, of what not to do. But uh, it also shows you exactly, you know, firsthand what it was that I was describing. One other thing I wanted to point out too, if you notice I picked up a couple of pieces and I kind of pointed at those little bitty stubs sticking out like this one right here. So you got these little stub branches sticking out here on this end as well as up here on this end. All right, now we have the good fortune of not having to cut all of our wood. We have a, a tree trimmer or two that uh, drops us by loads of wood occasionally and uh, we never complain or anything at all but uh, they don't trim quite like we do. A lot of times we'll trim up before we bring over and put in the pile but a lot of times there's such a quantity we just don't have time and can't do it. So that's whenever you see me pick those up and then kind of hold them lengthways whatever and stick them into there and go ahead and cut those off with the saw blade. Uh, a lot of times I have my axe over in the wood pile whenever we're, we're bringing them over here and I'll be lopping those off with a sharp bit of the axe but a lot of times like I said just can't can't stay on top of it so we don't but I wanted to point that out and again that's a little bit dangerous you know but you know I'm comfortable with it because I've been doing it for so long and you got to stop and think too you know we, we use these old buzz saws out on the farm to uh, sharpen uh, take take round cedar a red cedar of a certain diameter you know up to maybe seven or eight inches in diameter and you cut them whatever length you want for your fence post plus a little bit to go in the ground you split them in half so you make split rails and then now you got a, a nasty squared end so now you want to use a saw rig to taper those and to sharpen those ends and even down on smaller poles on small cedar poles that are that are like four and five and six inches in diameter it's not quite big enough to split in half and get you two fence posts out of one uh, one stub we have to sharpen that rounded end you know like four different directions on the buzz saw so you're used to standing back here and holding that and sticking that in there and tapering that end of those split rails so that you've got a a nice point to drive into the ground with your with your post mall. So again, it's dangerous if you're not around it. It's dangerous if you've not not experienced with it. I've been doing this for so long, it's just pretty much second nature. That ain't to say that I'm not going to slip and fall and cut my hand off at a wrist tomorrow. It might happen this afternoon. I don't know. I don't want it to, but I know that that's a risk that I'm taking. But then again, that's why I minimize the risk by going through all the safety procedures that I've showed you. And there's many others too. I just can't think of how to put them into words in an impromptu situation without sitting down and writing a dissertation, which I'm not going to do. But at any rate, I uh, hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, again, once again, this is not a how you do it video or how, a how to video. It's just plain how I do, how I've done, how I'm going to do. Hey, just ain't no danger at all. We just enjoy it. It's, it's free wood, it's free heat, and we're taking advantage of what would normally be put in a landfill. So you know what? That's the end of the safety lesson. The very first safety video I think I've ever done. But, but the main thing, this is really to, to let you guys that may have an opportunity to pick up an old buzzsaw, to, just to allay your fears, so to speak, because I know there's horror stories. Now, some of those horror stories are true, but not one of us has ever been cut with the blade in operation. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I apologize it's so long, but you just got to get the link to the video in order to get out the points that I needed to bring out. That's certainly not all the points that need to be brought out, but it's all I can think of right now. And you know what? This is Trackman 44, and I am out of here, guys.